It's the final week of the month. You know what that means. It's style study time. Now, today's style study is a little different because we're not looking at an illustrator per se, but rather as a concept artist. So today's video is mostly going to be a concept art masterclass on how to best present your concepts in a dynamic, catchy, and very aesthetically pleasing way. Today we're looking at the incredible concepts of American concept artist Jack Burke, aka Subjectively. And today's video was requested on Discord by our Discord member Tiger, so thank you so much for this request and I really hope it is everything you've been looking for. If you're a style study veteran, thank you so much for coming back and I love you. But if this is your very first style study, hi, welcome. My name is Rish and I'm so glad you're here because today we're gonna level up your art by like a million percent. Style Study is a regular series we do here on my channel where we take a look at some of our favorite contemporary artists, analyze their work and see what we can learn from it. Keyword, learn. We're not here to plagiarize anyone's work or copy their style, we're only here to learn some really cool art tips and tricks and see how we can apply them to finding our own unique art style. Now, because this is very different to the usual style studies we do, we're going to divide this video in two parts. Part one, as usual, is going to be an analysis where we take a look at Jack's work, analyze his style and see what we can learn from it. But for part two, I thought instead of doing a study of concept art, today we'll take a look at making our own concept art and see if we're able to present it a little better using the principles that we learn in part one. So it's a little different, but hopefully just as impactful as the other cells to do. Of course, if you enjoyed this video and learned something today, please remember to like and subscribe. Comment below your biggest takeaway from this study and check out all of Jack's work as well as my social media. Links are all in the description below. But now if you're ready for a concept art masterclass, grab a snack, sit back, and let's dive into another style study featuring Jack Burr. Jack Burke is a freelance character concept artist and illustrator from Boston, USA. According to his ArtStation profile, he graduated from the Massachusetts College of Art and Design and he also writes fiction that he hopes to have published someday. Now, while Jack's concepts are absolutely amazing and so unique, it's kind of hard to try and get into someone's brain and replicate their thought process. However, there is more to concept art than just coming up with good ideas. It is also about being able to illustrate said ideas in an eye-catching way. And if you're watching this today, you probably have a million concepts floating around your head, but aren't quite sure how to put them down on canvas. So that is what we're going to focus on learning today. Jack's beautiful art has garnered him over 137,000 followers on Instagram and over 320,000 subscribers on his YouTube channel Subjectively, which he runs with some of his friends. Jack paints these super dynamic concepts and I know we tend to throw around the word dynamic a lot when talking about art that we love but today I really want to explore what that means because regardless of whether he's painting humans, creatures or even machines, each concept feels dramatic and just alive. Not only are these concepts very visually pleasing, they are also self-explanatory. They work as standalone illustrations, but they also really beautifully illustrate the story behind each concept. In that sense, Jack is definitely a fabulist. Speaking of this, here are four key characteristics to Jack Burke's art. The strongest element in Jack's concept has to be the silhouette. No matter how simple or complex the concept is, the silhouette is always, always of paramount importance. The edges of his characters and creatures create these very distinctive, noticeable shapes, and each aspect of the silhouette is very precise and well thought out. There's a couple of different ways in which he does this. 
First, the negative space. You'll see that the negative space plays a very important role in Jack's silhouette because they are often made of very sharp angles and tend to break up larger areas that would otherwise be way too uniform. This is a really great example of negative space being used to break up uniformity. All four of this character's limbs are made of very similar branchy looking shapes and you could put them parallel to each other and form a regular pattern, but that would be boring and static and also very unnatural. What Jack has done instead is create non-uniform negative space between and also within the limbs, which spaces them apart unevenly. Now the limbs look way more naturally posed and despite the character standing still, the silhouette appears somewhat dynamic. Another interesting thing that I noticed about the silhouette was that you could draw a continuous line around most, if not all of the character, no matter what it is. Take this character for instance, you could legit take a pen and trace around the outline with one solid line. And if you then also cut out the little bits of negative space, boom, now you can pretty much tell exactly what the character is doing and what they might even be wearing. It's like that Who's That Pokemon game we used to have on TV. You could tell which Pokemon were designed well and which ones weren't based on how their blocked in silhouette looked. The ability to create a solid line around the entire silhouette enhances the one fundamental aspect of good design, and that is readability. If you take away the details and just create a flat black blocked in shape where the only detail is in the outer edges of the silhouette, is your character still identifiable? Jack creates incredible readability in his silhouette, and that means that even if you were to minimize his characters, put them in a different scene, or hell, even recolor them, they would still read as that exact character, purely because of the shape language. One last detail I want to mention about the silhouette is the minimalism, but not quite. See, the thing is, while Jack paints these very detailed, complex characters, every single element contributes to the silhouette, if not in a front-facing view, then in a 360 turnaround. Look at this Minotaur character, for instance, love a Minotaur, but there's all these details on him that, in this view, don't necessarily contribute to the silhouette, but if we imagine rotating him around to the side, angle, and back views, each detail in the clothing, the hair, the face, and the armor would impact the silhouette. Same here with this Pokemon armor thing. There's a lot of detail that doesn't affect the silhouette at this angle, but if you imagine turning this character around, there isn't a single element on here that wouldn't significantly impact the silhouette. Every element is crucial to the overall shape language, and that is how you minimize elements on your character while keeping maximal impact. Okay, so this is where this study really changed up the way I think about concept art, because Jack doesn't just choose a pose that looks dynamic and alive and then just slap his character on it. When presenting his character, Jack very carefully and deliberately chooses the best pose that will highlight two very important aspects of every character design. The first is their abilities. This creature, for instance, has a jagged tail and a pretty streamlined body like a shark, so clearly it is designed for speed and damage. So putting it in this perspective, where it is diagonal to indicate speed and coming towards the viewer to show danger, fits the narrative perfectly. Here's a character based on a panther. Big cats aren't just known for their speed and killer instinct, but they are also known for their focus and precision. You've seen those nature documentaries, the puma doesn't just attack immediately, it sneaks in super close waiting for the exact moment and then boom. So when it comes to this character's pose, it's not just running forward, swords are swinging, <laughs> it is poised and waiting, katana still partly sheathed with a deeply focused expression. Its ability doesn't just lie in its strength and weapon, but also in its focus and timing. The other aspect of the character that Jack shows through good posing is their personality. 
Let's start with a human character. This paladin character is supposed to show off her strength more than anything else. Her weight is distributed evenly between her feet, she holds her chest up and shoulders back, and of course the gigantic sword looks incredibly heavy. It is a simple pose focused on stability and brute force, rather than anything super complicated or graceful. Here, on the other hand, is a dragon that is genuinely the most ladylike character that I've ever seen. Not only does she have some pearls and horns that look like Princess Leia buns, <laughs> look how she's looking over her shoulder all demure and just gently blowing fire at her own butt. <laughs> the pose conveys a very elegant, feminine personality type, despite this literally being a dragon. When Jack chooses a pose for his characters, it's not just to show off the many details about their visual attributes, it is also to give them functionality. Since these are concept pieces, the colour and lighting in Jack's art is often simplified in order to enhance the readability of the concept in a single glance. You'll usually see a flat, white, ambient light hitting the character from above, which has two main effects. First, it causes most of the lighting to be even, and all the shadows tend to hit the underside of the character. There's no excessive drama, pretty much all the important stuff is plainly visible. This is great when you're looking at concept art, because it gives you a good look at the key features. The other effect of a white ambient light is that the colours all appear true to form. A lot of the time when we use dramatic light that's super warm or super cool or even neon, it alters every colour that it touches. And while that is excellent when it comes to painting a believable scene, you want your concept art to reflect the true colours of each element. That doesn't mean, however, that the colours are boring. In fact, Jack uses very vibrant tones, very high saturation, and also lots of colour gradients. It's just that they are in white light, meaning the colours aren't altered by the light source. In his more recent art, however, it looks like Jack is exploring more drama and glowy light elements and such, like here where there's much higher contrast and very, very high saturation colours, or here where it looks like there's almost like a warm glow hitting this creature's underbelly. When it comes to the textures in Jack's work, while he does paint a lot of scales and feathers and fur and such, it doesn't feel realistic. Like there is a sort of cartoony quality to the textures because they're usually made of rather large flat shapes as opposed to tons of tiny little pores and grain that you might get from a textured brush. I think this really, really further helps the readability because you're not having to look at a bunch of tiny light and shadow shapes and try and suss out how a certain area might feel. Again, a single glance and you can pretty much tell exactly what you're looking at. Finally, let's talk about some details in Jack's concept art that are specifically chosen for style purposes. First, there's the line. Jack's art is actually quite heavy on the line art, but you don't necessarily notice said lines because they're usually very dynamic and subtle. This is a great example, the Kentrosaurus, I think I said that right, <laughs> where the lines outline the creature, yes, but there's also the smaller lines that define the legs, add a bit of dimension to the tail and neck, and define the eye and mouth. There are also some texture lines, like this spiral at the knee, but they don't even register as lines because not only do they get thick and thin along the form, sometimes they are also coloured to be just a tiny bit darker than the surrounding colours. And as a result, while these lines add definition, they also blend right into the overall design. Next, there's the relatively flat colours and hard edges. The flat colours might sound counterintuitive, given that there's a lot of gradients that appear smoothly blended in Jack's art. If we look at this piece here, for instance, it looks like a beautiful gradient from light to dark blue in the wings, but it's actually made of hard edges. 
I'm not gaslighting you, I promise. Let's zoom in real quick. <laughs> the edges are subtle, but you definitely see some very flat blues. It's just that there are so many in-between colors that are so similar in value that it appears like a smooth gradient when it's actually not. I think you can see it clearer here since we're basically only looking at value, but do you see how the grays look like they're getting darker in a smooth gradient in the body and also in the tail? But when we zoom in, it's just large areas of flat color that gradually get just a little darker than the previous color. Adjacent colors are low contrast and so they appear to be blended out. This way Jack preserves texture and hard plane shifts without everything looking super harsh or adding photo texture. Finally, let's talk about one aspect of design that Jack does every single time that you and I invariably forget about. Repetition. Be it through recurrent design elements, shapes, or colors, Jack uses repetition to create the all-important rhythm in his work. This is easiest to observe in the dinosaur pieces because a lot of them have spikes, which are a series of repetitive shapes. With this character, you have feathers, which are again, repetitive shapes. In this dragon fish guy, you see a repetition of color and texture that makes us think all those green crystal looking bits are made of the same stuff. And of course here you have repeating strawberries. Repetition allows our viewers to move across the painting at a certain pace, looking past some areas quickly and then slowing down at others. And this is why even in Jack's most static concept, where there's a soft silhouette and a resting pose, the piece as a whole still looks like it has rhythm and movement. So to sum up part one, here are four key characteristics to Jack Burke's art. Number one, the silhouette is everything. Good shape language and use of negative space makes each character instantly readable and therefore memorable. Two, Jack carefully chooses the pose of each character, not just to make them appear dynamic and alive, but also to show off their skill set and more importantly, their personality. Number three, the lighting is generally just a flat ambient white light, which allows for good visibility of all key design aspects and also makes sure that everything is true to color. And number four, stylistic choices like varied line weights, flat colors and low contrast but hard edge plane shifts and repetition of shapes and colors allows for very dynamic, beautiful concepts with a lot of rhythm and life. So, like I said at the beginning, it kind of felt unproductive just to study a concept because this video is more about presenting an original concept the way Jack does as opposed to rendering the way he does. So instead, I started by building a concept of my own. For this character, I wanted to go with a sort of celestial theme, like she's gestating a star. I wanted her to look fiery but also flowy, kind of like our galaxies appear. Now this is where I veered off script a little and tried to create a secondary light source, the star itself. Don't worry, I simplified it later. I tried a couple different poses for her, but in the end I settled for this one. It felt feminine but fixed, almost defiant. I feel like if you're someone who births stars on the regular that go on to then create entire planetary systems of their own, you'd have to have a defiant streak. <laughs> Looking back, I kind of wish I'd included more negative space in the silhouette, but I also like how rounded out everything is. So I don't know, you let me know if I should have spent longer focused on the negative space. I made sure to use a lot of repetition in those hanging pendants, the hip folds, and also in the highlighted areas of her hair. The overall colors are true to form, except that blue light. I eventually swapped it out for a gold, but we'll get there. I actually went over everything to create another layer of line art, particularly trying to emulate the lines that Jack draws on his human characters. 
I actually ended up cutting more of her rib cage out and creating a bigger distance between her upper and lower halves, which held the silhouette a little. And instead of an airbrushed glowy bit, decided to rein it in with just a simple sphere and instead imply the glow by reflecting it on the character. And yep, I swapped the blue for an orangey gold and this just feels better. The rest of the process was just refinement and for the background I just did a simple frame and then pasted in some photo textures so it didn't just look like flat rectangles. And after all of that, here's the final concept. What do you guys think? And there we have it, Jack Burke demystified. I feel like for me personally, this was a step up in how I present my concept art and more importantly, how I even think about concept art in the first place. But what was your biggest takeaway from this study? Do you think you'll dabble in more concept art after today? Comment below and let me know. I have of course linked all of Jack's work in the description below, so make sure you go check him out and show him some love for me if you haven't already. And thank you so much again to Tiger from our Discord server for requesting this video. I really hope you enjoyed it and that it was everything you've been looking for. And if the rest of you guys have enjoyed this video as well, make sure to let me know by giving it a big thumbs up and subscribe to my channel for more art content every single week. Are there any other artists you'd like to see a style study on in the future? First check out my style study playlist, it will show up here in just a second. I've done a ton of these across the years and chances are I've probably covered some of your faves on the series before. But if I haven't, feel free to leave me a comment below or come tell me on my Discord server and I'll add your artists to my ever-growing list. And that's about everything for this video, so thank you guys so, so much for hanging out with me. I really hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. Check out some more style studies down here and I'll see you guys on the next one. Bye!